Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. I'm going to start you off with one of my favorite maps here. It shows land use around the world, and I want you to focus in on this color right here. That's where we have global cropland. Feel free to pause the video and take a closer look. But as I get started today, I want to continue with the storyline we've been covering for quite some time, and I want to take you to India, just south of New Delhi, where this video emerged early this morning showing what we've been anticipating, which is the movement of locusts into this part part of India. Now, this is from FAO, uh, so you can take a look here and see where we're expecting in June, July the locusts to go, but take a look at the video. This was uh, earlier today uh, showing us this part, just, again, just south of New Delhi here, another swarm of locusts moving across the area. Now, the forecast for this region was to hit 101 degrees Fahrenheit today, and the main threat was widespread dust and locust. Now, speaking of dust, of course, we watched quite a bit of dust coming off the Sahara over the last week, and you can see it in this visible satellite image here, which was on Friday. And as that dust spread into parts of the southern, southeast, and even in the central part of the United States, we saw a lot of pictures like these emerge. One over there on the right showing some of the dust on top of a car after a rain, and this one here from a bank in Houston showing the degradation in air quality. So some pretty amazing pictures here of what that dust did. But I was interested over the weekend, and this, uh, this particular question I was interested and came from my good friend Paige, she was talking about uh, what this dust might be bringing to the United States because we know that annually about 800 million metric tons of dust blow off of the Sahara across the Atlantic. So I read a paper about the mineralogy of uh, Saharan dust and this is what I found. Uh, the Saharan dust is mainly composed of quartz, feldspars, and clays. We wonder if there's any benefit to this and we do know that in feldspars of course there's a lot of potassium. Overall, I don't, of course I don't study this, but I think it's a good question to be asking if we could get any sort of benefit from having this dust in place once it is precipitated out of the atmosphere. Now speaking of precipitation, this satellite animation here showing you infrared temperatures kind of tells us the main story uh, over the next week. And you can see the deep level spin that's in the Pacific Northwest. That is a very deep trough. And out ahead of it, moving through parts of the Dakotas last night and into Minnesota, a lot of severe weather and that extended all the way down into parts of Nebraska yesterday. We also had some extremely heavy rain in parts of southern Indiana Indiana and also Kentucky and this stormy pattern we have to ask ourselves how long will it be sticking around because it'll be important to see who gets the rain when this ridge finally builds into the Great Lakes. In the overnight hours three complexes of storms I was watching one in the Dakotas another one stalled out here in parts of Minnesota giving us some flooding rains there and you can see a very narrow strip running through here very active lightning in the overnight hours from southern Indiana through Kentucky and over toward Knoxville Tennessee. So as we look over the last 72 hours. There were a few pockets of very, very heavy rainfall in parts of Kansas, getting over into parts of Illinois, Indiana, and then into Kentucky. As you can see, there's some places picking up well in excess of five inches of rain. But what I'm looking for in this particular map are some places where we missed out on some of the rain over the last uh, over the last weekend. Talking to some friends in Ohio who the storms just kind of crisscrossed and missed them to the north. And then as you can see down there in the southern plains, things were quite dry as well. Looking at the last week on the whole, some locally very heavy rainfall, uh, but some beneficial rains came into this part of Kansas, southeastern Nebraska, and into western Missouri, a place that had been very dry. But what I'd like to do for you uh, very quickly here is we want to look at the haves and the have-nots. Now certainly extremely wet in eastern Texas through parts of southern Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, but if you just go to the same map and then remove everything that's less than an inch, there are a lot of holes here. Now we talked about how our pattern with the retreating jet stream to the north was going to go full on to a, um, you know, to a thunderstorm regime and that's just where it's going to be hit or miss. And one of the questions I'm going to try to answer by the end of this video is does that continue through the middle part of the month of July. Because since the beginning of June, we've seen these changes in our soil moisture. Now, thankfully, as we're going to get this map updated here uh, over the next couple of days, I think we're going to see some improvement in this area. Maybe not down there in parts of Oklahoma. Let me redraw that. Some improvement in this area where the heavy rains came through. And also in Illinois and Indiana where some very beneficial rains came through. But there are pockets in the eastern Chrome Belt that were missed. We will see improvements in North Dakota as well as with some recent rain 
rain and some of the rain that we are forecasting. But where we do have our drought that still exists right in through this area, I do expect some expansion of that. And with the ridge that's going to be racing toward the Great Lakes, higher pressure is going to build in in this area and really possibly limit precipitation to only pop up thunderstorms here in, as we move forward. Uh, across the cotton belt, though, we do have a setup that I think could be bringing some very beneficial thunderstorms moving forward here. Our pattern's a bit bunched up today. You can see the omega pattern that's sitting here just off the west coast. And because of that, this trough is going to be here for quite some time. The ridge that runs over the Great Lakes here is also going to be well established as we work our way through the middle part of the month. And I want you to watch very carefully a feature that I'll be paying attention to here in the next couple of days as it gives us a unique view of an inland rotation in the upper level winds that could produce some very heavy rainfall in that area. The National Weather Service is watching it. Early this morning, the National Weather Service out of St. Louis issued this flood watch. The stalled out storms over parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin getting a flood watch, and from the storms yesterday here that went through parts of Kentucky flood watch. But notice as you get west of there, heat advisory still in place in South Dakota. Heat advisory, we're going to get triple digit heat here in parts of the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas. And with strong winds coming in, fire threat. But where that deep trough is sitting, in the base of it, frost, flooding out ahead of it, and a very stormy pattern. I know this map, of course, doesn't extend up into Canada, but a very stormy pattern into Canada as well. So with that as our kind of backdrop here, I want to tell you the three big features I'm watching, all right? That trough that's over the Pacific Northwest, a couple of short waves are going to pull through it, giving us what we call the Fujiwara effect, which means the trough is going to orbit and eventually retrograde back uh, to the west. So very stormy and cool, wet pattern for parts of the Pacific Northwest and the Canadian prairies. Big ridge builds into the Great Lakes states toward the Hudson Bay. That's going to be bringing on the heat. And also we're going to watch a trough kind of try to sneak its way back from the east to the southeast. Uh, and the other place I want to keep you to keep your eye on here is going to be over Europe, specifically Scandinavia, as I play this animation forward. So here we go. Oops, I apologize. Now here we go. This particular setup here, you can see the trough sticking around the Pacific Northwest all the way through the end of this week. And as we move forward, look at this large ridge that builds into the Great Lakes states. High pressure underneath this is going to be of concern to me. Why I think this pattern may get bunched up and start to exhibit blocking behavior, which means it gets stuck in a pattern for about 10 days, is downstream of it. This big trough that's sitting here over Scandinavia, this region, could be critical when it's combined with the ridge over Alaska to really not allowing this pattern to move as we get our way into the middle of the month. So here we are all the way out to the 7th of July, and again we see that same thing. See the trough that's almost extending across this whole part here? That's going to be critical as we move forward into the middle part of this month. Now watch what's going on with the upper level heights. I want you to uh, pay specific attention to the Pacific Northwest. As we play this forward, what you're going to see is this wave and this wave orbit one another. We call that the Fujiwara effect. And what it does is it sends continual short waves through the Canadian prairies, setting off a lot of thunderstorm activity here in parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan. And that's going to be critical to their moisture as we move into the mid part of the growing season. At the end of this here, back on July the 4th now, you can see the large ridge bringing in the heat into the Great Lakes states. But before that gets here, I'm going to take you back to this Monday night into Tuesday morning. We're watching this piece right here, this shortwave that's going to be sitting and spinning over parts of Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa. Very unique feature. And I'm going to show you the rain and the fall that's going to come out of that. And as we get into the middle of this week, look at the deep trough that is over parts of the Northeast. So with that as your setup, I expect to see a lot more of these types of storms stretching across the midsection of the United States. Uh, Chris sent in this great picture of a shelf cloud out of Wisconsin. And with the pattern I see evolving, it's going to be one that's going to exhibit a lot of what we call mesoscale convective system type storms. And in the Canadian prairies, you could see more of this. This was sent out uh, south of Calgary uh, over the weekend where the hail piled up up to eight inches. We've seen some massive hailstorms in that area. I don't think we're done with these types of storms by any stretch of the imagination. And by the way, when I was watching this this morning, I'm like, ah, that's just like the Canadians, right? Get your snowmobiles out. But that wasn't a snowmobile. I see that's a three-wheeler. Uh, but uh, just amazing to see what that um, uh, the hail looked like here. Okay, into the forecast we go. 
National Weather Service over the next week, there's a boundary stalling in through this area. And there's that shortwave I mentioned that could be bringing in some very heavy rainfall here. We see the heavy rainfall spreads toward the southeast as well. Where we're missing this, look at this section of the eastern Corn Belt getting into parts of the northeast like Pennsylvania. Look at the dryness forecast over here in the southwestern plains getting into the high plains. Extremely heavy rainfall in this part of Idaho and Montana and active storms up in the Canadian prairies. Putting this all compared to normal, this is what things look like. So I'm getting concerned now about the heat that's coming in here, the high evaporation rates, and the regional drought development. Same thing as the high pressure cell moves into this part of the United States. In between, it's some heavy rains in the near term, but we're going to have to watch and see how that all unfolds. No tropical activity that I can see coming into the Gulf anytime soon, at least over the next five to seven days. Severe weather threat Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday across the top there. As that deeper upper level low kind of pulls out of the Pacific Northwest, we will be watching. Look at this. This is some great moisture transport into this area, giving us a major risk of severe storms. Outside of that, from the Mid-South over toward the Southeast, you can see on Tuesday and Thursday risk of strong to severe storms as well. Our fire threat is very high in the Great Basin and the Four Corner States due to very strong winds, also in California as well as we begin this week. So let's watch it with our European model. Now remember the things we're going to pay attention to. The stalled out boundary in through here, also the little uh, mid-level flow uh, circulation that's going over parts of like near St. Louis. Then the deep trough that's going to be here lighting up sections of the north central plains into the Canadian prairies and our exiting trough that's here. Ready? playing this forward, let's pause it right there. Through the next 48 hours, we're going to be seeing widespread storms spreading through here on Monday. And of course, around our upper level trough that's moving in the northwest in the Canadian prairies. By Tuesday morning, the potential exists for very heavy rainfall in the year. That's why we have the flood watch out for this area. This is getting in the overnight hours on Monday into Tuesday morning, afternoon, and evening. See it there. So thunderstorm threat here. Now, as I go past this day, again, I want to mention severe thunderstorm threat in through here first. But as we go past Tuesday into Wednesday, this boundary in through here kind of erodes. And why it erodes is because high pressure tries to build in toward the end of the week over the Great Lakes states. So it's stormy in the northwest, it's stormy here in the Canadian prairies, and it's stormy to the south of it here from Virginia all the way down to like the lower Mississippi River Valley. But higher pressure takes over in this section of the country with the heat that's coming on. As we work our way out to the 4th of July, well this is Saturday morning. Saturday afternoon and evening. So we can see the influence of that high pressure with maybe more natural fireworks that run the periphery of it. See that? That's what we're going to look out for for the end of this week. As we look out into week two, the GFS ensemble on the left, the European on the right, we do paint this corridor as stormy. And overall, that's where we're running around, but will be a, a flow pattern that does something like this. So ridge is setting up here, and it will extend early in toward this area. But as we get into week two, some of the models are suggesting that ridge backs up. And so we get this stormy pattern that runs along its periphery. Now, any location in through here that misses out on the rainfall in the near term is going to be watching for some regional drought development. And the European model wants to keep parts of the cotton belt wet. It's been very consistent with that. That's all due to the way the upper level low slides over the southeast in the GFS compared to the European. So you can see some discrepancy in the week two between our models here. I believe that the European is the favored flow pattern as we look forward in this. Now let's talk temperatures. This map shows you number of 90 degree days we've had since the beginning of May. And I apologize, this should say the 27th up here, not the 24th. So we've had some heat already, but what I wanna see is where we've really kinda of gone over that threshold and got into the triple digits. And through the 27th of the month, we do have a lot of heat down here in the southwest where we expect it and in the Central Valley of California. But we have really limited our 100 degree days from expanding out of the southern plains. Well that be, will be changing in the near term here. This is uh, valid on Monday. We're going to see upper 90s and lower 100s extending much farther to the north so that'll certainly change those numbers while much above average temperatures move into this section of the United States. Where's the cold air? It's tucked into that trough. We're going to be seeing highs here struggling to get out of the 50s. Playing this one forward, let's pause it here, take a look at Tuesday's high temperatures and departure from normal. Look at this extreme heat coming into this part of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. And as we go forward, Wednesday's highs, Thursday, getting into Friday, and toward our 4th of July holiday on Saturday, very, very hot 
and humid here in the north central plains so could be some pop-up storms under that dome of high pressure but very very warm fourth of july for this section of the united states meanwhile parts of the cotton belt southeast we can see temperatures here in the middle 80s so it could be warm over the great lakes and over the southeast as we work our way into this upcoming weekend day six through ten we're getting into the hottest time of year we see that extending from the southwest all the way up to the hudson bay much above average temperatures we're kind of painting the corners of the united states the northwest and the southeast with near average to cooler than average and both the gfs and the europeans seeing that same pattern evolve here my concern is as we get to the middle of the month with the heat that's coming on here and therefore the increased evaporation rates will there be regional drought stresses developing uh, because of the lack of rainfall now and the high evapotranspiration rates later now what i'll be discussing this week in the long range the mad julian oscillation is finally looks to be kind of emerging where it's been for several days in phase one and two and start to get back on its move counterclockwise on this phase diagram during that time period though we could be seeing some excellent upper level support for the development of easterly waves coming off of Africa, which means we're going to keep a close eye on the tropics for any tropical development. Now, the Southern Oscillation Index is still negative, even though we're getting some better trade winds moving forward. But what I'm mostly concerned about, and I'll address this again midweek, is what's going on with the Northern Hemisphere jet stream pattern. If we start to lose momentum there, I get concerned. Now, the jet stream has retreated north, but up to this point through the next 10 days, look at these streamlines. I don't see anything shutting down the Gulf of Mexico just yet. So that means that even with the higher pressure building in here, with the humid conditions, we'll still get a lot of pop-up storms, but that'll be hit or miss in nature. This will be the number one thing I'll be most concerned about for the United States. Is there anything coming up in the pattern that will shut down Gulf of Mexico transport for this part of the world? And in the Pacific Northwest, the models have biased you way too warm in the forecast moving forward. So as we start to see the temperatures staying cool there, this is much more of a reality, I think, as we move forward in the forecast. The last couple things I want to point out are international. We're watching a big upper level trough sweep through parts of Europe. But notice in and around the Black Sea, conditions are dry over the next 10 days. And at the same time, the heat is coming on to that area as well. So we could be watching some sort of a weather story emerge from the Black Sea area. And finally, over in China, we've had major flooding along the Mayu front, and it's forecast to continue that way. When you look at the productive ground that is in and around Beijing, which I just put an X through, including north of the Korean Peninsula, conditions look a bit more favorable in the near term here. So with that, I'm going to wrap this one up. I hope you all have a great week, and I'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.